we test Toyota's largest SUV on the street and in the mountains. Is this aging beast still a competitive option? That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. In the past year, the leaders in the large SUV segment have all rolled out major updates. The Ford Explorer, Chevy Tahoe, and GMC Yukon all received stem to stern improvements in technology, looks, and handling. But then there's the Toyota Sequoia. It was all new way back in 2008. Of course, Toyota hasn't exactly been standing still. Over the years, they have added nips and tucks in addition to entertainment and safety tech upgrades to keep the Sequoia relevant. But have they done enough? Let's dig in. This is a 2021 Sequoia Nightshade Special Edition. Like other Toyotas that have adopted the same moniker, the Nightshade adds blacked out emblems, a special grille, and 20 inch wheels to a limited package. Prices you see it here with some extra upgrades, 67,955 US dollars, including delivery. Even though the industry is moving to turbocharged sixes, here Toyota soldiers on with a 5.7 liter V8. It makes up to 381 horsepower and 401 pound-feet of torque. The only transmission is a six-speed automatic with a dual-range transfer case. When equipped with optional four-wheel drive, towing capacity is limited to 7,100 pounds with the included hitch and hookups. EPA rates this setup at 13 miles to the gallon in the city and 17 on the highway, making this one of the least efficient SUVs you can buy today. If you need to do a recovery or move some trees, tow hooks in the front are easily accessible. The Sequoia shares the same body-on-frame chassis as the Tundra truck, but unlike the Tundra, the Sequoia gets independent rear suspension, which improves handling and allows for more storage space in the back. Open up the power lift gate to reveal 18.9 cubic feet behind the third row, 66.6 .6 cubic feet behind the second row, and a solid 120.1 cubic feet with all the rows folded flat. There's also a secret cubby under the false floor. Now let's see how usable that last row is for an adult. You know, I've been in worst third rows. This isn't too bad. I have headroom, I have leg room. For as old of an architecture as this current generation Sequoia is, this is actually pretty good. Uh, there is a couple things I want to note though. Uh, first off, lots of cup holders. We have four of them in the back, as well as a cubby down here. I also get my own vent. But here's the weird thing. To get out, I don't have a switch here. Oh, look, it's a foot switch. Ha! Easy grip handle there to pull myself up because this does ride really high. Okay, I got a commanding view. These are, of course, captain's chairs. So I have an armrest right there that I can adjust. How do I adjust that? Oh, it goes up, 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 down, up, up, up. Okay. I also have an entertainment system with my own independent volume controls and it's a flip down Blu-ray in the middle. This second row entertainment option is, quite frankly, the worst possible way you can spend $2,000 in 2021. It doesn't even have HDMI inputs, just ancient composites. Seriously, skip this option. It does have a fold down cup holder in the console, which is handy, in addition to privacy screens. Now let's see how this looks up front. In the past year, I've spent a lot of time in all new three row crossovers. And this thing just looks ancient. I know it's getting a refresh soon, an all new refresh. It's moving to a new chassis. It's gonna be all new soon. However, soon cannot come soon enough. This thing, I, I don't even know what to say. The sunroof is just a standard little sunroof. Uh, they haven't updated this to get a panorama. I imagine the next edition will because that's all the hotness right now. And then there's the materials. These are some super cheap feeling and looking plastics. Not, there's, a, there's a lot of, oh, what's that? 
I don't know what I'd put in there, but uh, there's a removable piece. Not only is it kind of an old style design, it's a little bit of a mess, even by old design standards. I mean, we have like this little cutout here for the driver and then a secondary cutout and then a third cutout over there. And that screen is tiny by this interior. And I know that shows its age, but come on, man. What is that, a six inch screen? Six, I mean, even the Forerunner has an eight inch screen now. That thing, I, I don't even know what to do. This is ridiculous. I'm also super high up, as large as this vehicle is, I don't have a lot of headroom. I would expect to be able to wear, you know, a cowboy hat in here, but I certainly could not. The basic comforts are here. It feels comfortable. I have a very high commanding view of the world. In fact, I would like the seat to go down a little further, but this is it. It'll go up, but it won't go down any further than what I had it. Now it is powered. You can go back, forth, we get lumbar support, seat warmers right there. We got the dials. Actually, those are like out of a Lexus. But then we have like big dials here, which are fine. You know, this is a truck, essentially. So that's all okay. But you know, it just, oh man, it just looks old. Well, let's talk about the features that we have here. This has been updated at least with a lot of the new safety tech. Uh, we have adaptive cruise control, lane detection, and collision mitigation. All I think very important things to have in a car when you're spending this much money in 2021. We do get a tiny, tiny little screen in here flanked by a bunch of traditional dials. And of course, over here, we have the tiny infotainment system. It has all of the basics. I mean, it has a home screen where we got map on the right, audio and phone. Here I can use navigation because this does come with the navigation option. Let's go ahead and search for Starbucks. It's a little slow, but it is based on internet access, I believe. Yep, and there we go. It's not the best system, but it is functional. I wouldn't pay extra for the navigation unless I'm getting it with a bunch of other stuff. There also is voice assistant. Navigate to the nearest Starbucks. It is using cloud processing. Searching. So it sends my voice up and then sends back the results. Up. There we go. Beginning of list. Number one. To navigate to this point. Of there we go. It actually works pretty decently. And when I start talking, it'll actually stop talking over me, which I kind of like. Now I get three USB sockets up here. Only one will interface with the head unit. And when I do, I get Apple CarPlay. It also supports Android Auto. Even though this is a small display, it is a high quality display, but it's so far away, I can't even reach it without leaning over here. It's like, why is it so far over there? So the fact that it's a small display to begin with, and then they put it so far away, it makes it look like it's a four inch screen. It's ridiculous. Overall, it's a throwback, man. This thing is a throwback. But if you want the core capabilities in a vehicle that'll probably still be running 30, 40, 50 years from now, Sequoia, man. The Nightshade Edition is based on the Limited trim, and the Limited comes with a lot of the extras that you just don't get in a base trim vehicle. You get these leather seats, you get the upgraded head unit, you know, just lots of little things. And I think for some people that is important. You also get these really big wing mirrors with very large indicators, which I kind of like. It's, a, it's kind of a big truck kind of feel. And I think that's, you know, that works here. Okay, well, let's stop talking about this interior and let's see what the Sequoia in 2021 can do. You could say that the Sequoia is a bit of an anachronism. It is a vehicle that just doesn't seem to fit into the current time. Now, I say that mostly from the driver's seat here, because on the outside, it actually looks pretty good. But when you start delving into the features, you're like, wow, they don't do that anymore. And gee, what's with this design? <laughs> But the core elements of why somebody would want a Sequoia are all solid. They're, it's solid in the fundamentals because they really got everything right back in 2008 when this vehicle uh, was last, you know, that's where the core is from. It's from 2008. 
Toyota has done a good job of updating this throughout the years, however. They've added LED lights, they've added CarPlay to the navigation system, which this infotainment is only a seven inch screen, and it's so far away it looks super tiny, but you know, it actually has, again, the core fundamentals. And then you look at towing capacity, you're over 7,000 pounds on all the trims of the Sequoia. I think this one is 7,300. It depends on what drivetrain you get, because you can get this in two wheel drive or four wheel drive with various packages. Now the model we're testing here is kind of a mid range. This is an upper mid range, I guess. And what you get is a vehicle that is again, very good with the fundamental things that you want in a vehicle like this. It drives really nice actually, because it has independent suspension in the front and the back. Now it is a super windy day today, and I'm not getting battered around that much on the freeway, other than the fact that this is a large vehicle, so it's taking a lot of blunt force wind, uh, but the, the fact that it has independent suspension is really helping keep me tracking without much abuse. In terms of active safety, it has all the stuff you would want, blind spot warning, collision mitigation, but it also has adaptive cruise control, which Toyota has been adding to all their vehicles in the last couple years. All I have to do is turn it on, and there we go, and I can set pace. Now, it does have lane detection, but it does not have lane centering, which is something I would like to see them add in a vehicle like this. Now this is a large SUV and it competes very closely with that Tahoe that we tested just a couple weeks ago. But this one is the other end of the scale where the Tahoe is in mid $80,000 price range and has every bell and whistle, but no auto steer that you can imagine. This one is just more about the fundamentals of owning a large crossover or SUV. It has a ton of cargo space. It has 7,000 pound plus towing capacity. It has a big V8 engine, a six speed automatic transmission. If that's what you need, the Sequoia is a good option. And you know this thing's gonna run forever. We don't often talk about reliability because it's not something we can actually test, but there are certain brands that are known for the reliability and Toyota has done a very good job of earning that reputation. Now, just because this is a large SUV doesn't mean that we can't go a little off-roading with it and we're going to go up the rock trail today. And the reason we're doing that is because it has 10 inches of ground clearance and you can also get this in a TRD Pro version. Now, the TRD Pro does have a different suspension setup than this one, but you know, Again, fundamentally, they're very similar. Quick weather update, it hasn't snowed down here in the last few days. Uh, in fact, it's been a pretty mild winter. Normally we would have snow stacked up down here at this time of year, but uh, no, we don't have much snow at all. So basically we get a little snow and then it melts off. Toyota's four wheel drive systems are really confusing. Four high is not four high. This would be called four auto on any other SUV. And the reason for that is, let me show you. I think this spot looks good. I'm gonna put the vehicle into four high, put it into drive, and we're gonna see just how tight of a turning radius we can do here. Now the thing you'll notice, there's no binding. Even though that says four high, you're not getting that chatter on the outside wheels that you would normally get with a locked center diff. And that's because this system actually has a torsion center differential. That means that it can actually move power independently front and back. Most automakers would call that four auto. With Toyota, what it is, they just call it four high, but they still give me the option to lock that center differential. And that is a proper center locker that is not like in the Palisade where you're suggesting for the middle differential to kind of maybe keep power. Actually, they just use a clutch. Uh, this one is a properly locked differential. And now when I enable that, I'll roll forward, okay. Now we're getting binding. See how that binding's working? That's because it's trying to put exactly 50% of power to the front and to the back. And this is actually really stressful on the drivetrain, so I'm not gonna do this a lot, but I just wanted to show you how the system works. This is a proper four high, four low, and it does have a proper center locking differential. Um, this is actually really great. That means that when you're just driving around town, you can just keep it in four high, even on dry pavement, which is unusual for a large SUV.
uh, except for the ones that have, you know, four auto because that gives that capability. Now, if only Toyota would put this capability in all their other vehicles, but unlike, unfortunately in the 4Runner, you can only get that on the limited trim. It's time to do a zero to 60. Let's give that a try. I said how much I love the turning radius on this thing. It is fantastic. Okay, let's pull up here. Now, there's really not many things for me to play with here. There's no drive modes. I'm just gonna put it into four high because that's where I'm already in. And three, two, one, go. Dang, this thing's quick. And 60, 7.12 seconds. Very nice. On paved surfaces, it actually drives pretty nice. I mean, it is a very large vehicle and you feel that, but you know, roll is well controlled. Throttle is pretty good. The only thing I would say that I really don't like are the brakes. They're kind of squishy and squishy brakes are no fun. In the next few years, the Sequoia is going to get an all new platform. And I imagine that they'll, you know, have everything up to date in here. Of course, it'll probably add to the price. So are they gonna go, you know, more for that higher end audience like the Tahoe High Country? Or are they gonna keep it simple? Um, time will tell. But for now, let's head into the woods and see how this does on the rock trail. It's always interesting to drive a vehicle this large on the trail. It just doesn't feel right. <laughs> but this does have 10 inches of ground clearance. Yeah, more than a forerunner, which is kind of amazing. Now I have nothing to show me the status of my four wheel drive system. Um, all I know is I'm in four high right now and the suspension's doing a really good job of actually soaking up the irregularities. Now these tires are of course not, oh, hey, look at that. I can do a nice crossing. Well, let's have some fun. Oh, oh. <laughs> the 10 inches of ground clearance, that's important if you're gonna do stuff like this. Especially when you have a large vehicle with a long wheelbase, just that extra ground clearance really can help uh, get you through obstacles. The trail we're going on today isn't that difficult. It is an actual trailhead access road. So yeah, somebody would totally take this vehicle up there if they wanted to go hiking in that port part of the mountains. It is a normal thing. So yeah, you're not gonna look at it and go, you know, we're, we're not doing this to be extreme. We're doing it to demonstrate uh, features of the vehicle. Yeah, this is pretty good. It's pretty smooth. High commanding seating position is kind of beneficial in these conditions because I kind of feel like I can see all around the vehicle. For as large as it is, you know, visibility is great. I really have a good idea where my wheels are placed, even without cameras. It's obviously, this is a very well sorted vehicle. Uh, they, it was all new in 2008 and they have tweaked it endlessly uh, since then, giving it, you know, all sorts of modern updates from the new infotainment system, to snow, huh? Didn't expect to see snow. It's just a light powdering, so we should be okay. And here we have our first challenge. This is the lower section. Uh, the only real vehicle that had an issue with this was the Volvo um, hybrid, the plug-in electric hybrid with the uh, dual electric motors, but uh, most vehicles can get through this no problem. So we're kind of on packed gravel-ish on the right and on the left we have exposed rock. It is dry today even though there's a little bit of snow, so shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, and it's not. Climbs up, super easy. Now, I gotta be careful of these wheels. They are shiny black lacquer, and that is a design that just happens to scratch really easy. <laughs> so, don't wanna send this thing back all scratched up. Let's set up for this climb. Now, 
Uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it in for high and I'm going to let it figure it out and see how well this system can do before I need to lock that center diff. And that's it. So these, um, I should point out, these tires are all season radials. Not great. We do have snow on the ground, but there's not a lot of ice. It's mostly just snow on top of fairly dry surface. So I think the snow is not going to be a huge issue, but we'll see. So the first thing here is where we really remove traction off of this tire and that tire. First, I'll do it in four high, and then I'll lock the center diff, and then I'll do it in four low. And we'll see what the differences look like. So here we go. Now traction removed from those two wheels. I'm just gonna lay the throttle in. We're gonna see how this figures it out. It doesn't really. Okay, so let's go ahead now and switch it to center lock. And I'm just gonna proceed. And there we go. Gets me through it, no problem. Now the next level is of course four low. Let me back in and show you what four low looks like. Try to get the, gotta be careful, there's a lot of weight <laughs> sliding down the mountain. Okay, switch it into four low. I have to put it into neutral. Put it into drive. Now we're in four low, and that center automatically locks in four low. So now I'm going to proceed. And we have the same issue as before, a little slippery, but because the front and back power are locked together, we get through it no problem. And there we go. I think we're going to go ahead and proceed the rest of the way up in four low, uh, simply because it gives me better control over my throttle. Just creep on up. Now the tires we are running are the Bridgestone Dueler Alenzas, and they're okay. I'm not having any real issues here with them. Great. Come on, feel that power, shift around. I guess it's not really shifting, but like, let's put the power down. <laughs> Yeah, a little slippery. Yeah, it's getting a little slippery. I'm getting a little bit more snow on the top here. Get my nose in. And the final challenge, the hole on the right. See how it does with power. Oh, 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 you're gonna do it. You're gonna get it. And there we go. Now, it would be nice if this had a rear locking differential as well, but I think for most uses, this is just fine. This does not appear to have hill descent control. So we're just gonna see how well it does going down. Now we are in four low, so we can use engine braking. I'll go all the way down to S1. Manual shifting. Yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, it's a little quick though. And of course, engine compression doesn't do the exact same thing as hill descent because that uses brakes on individual wheels. It's kind of funny they don't include it here. Hmm. But overall, yeah, this is a perfectly fine vehicle if you want something large, it's gonna last forever. Maybe you only drive it, you know, 10 times a year to tow your boat to the lake. The Sequoia is a great option. You know this will be reliable. You know the, the maintenance on it will be low. Uh, it's unfortunate about the, uh, you know, the MPGs on it. But I think overall, this is a pretty good little rig. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, share us with your friends, and make sure to hit that like button. We do these for you, and we hope you enjoy them. Until next week, drive safe.